Hey everybody, welcome back to Coffee with Colada. Today we have an author, a movie star, well soon to be movie star, Nick Christophers. Give him a big uh, big welcome, uh, Nick. Say hello to everyone. Hey guys, how you doing? Pleasure to be here. Excellent. So let me ask you right off the bat, did you know Frank Collada? Uh, no, I, I know of him and uh, I spoke to him only one time uh, through a friend and but he was a great guy i liked i liked talking to him briefly and he had a very colorful lifestyle let's put it that way <laughs> to say the least definitely uh definitely a colorful guy uh, so so the um mutual friend that you had with frank who was that uh johnny a light Okay, Johnny A. Light, and I saw that you were you did some some shows with Johnny. You actually wrote a book with him, correct? Correct. That's right. Okay, so you've authored how many books now? Four. You did one of them with John, correct? That's correct. Called Prison Rules. Did you grow up with John? Colada, colada, grab your favorite brew. Ask a question, he'll answer it for you. The mafia, the mafia, the mafia, the mafia. You better hit prescribe if you know what's good for you. Drinking a cup of coffee with Frank Colada. He'll tell you a lot. He's Frank Colada. No, we didn't grow up too much. Too, uh, we didn't grow up, but uh, when we met, through a mutual friend, uh, we discovered that we had a lot of, we knew kind of the same guys growing up um, and we clicked. And at that point, we decided to put out a book called Prison Rules, which would be, it was more geared for the young people to try to like uh, scare them straight, uh, not to lead it, not to go into the street life, that prison is not the best place, you know, obviously not a good place to go. Um, even though some people, some guys may think, oh, it's good, you know, gives me my, gives me big creds, which it really doesn't. So that's what the book is kind of, it's through the eyes of Johnny A. I mean, you know, people that may know him, he's been in what, 16, he's been in prison 16 different years. And um, so he knows, he knows that life, you know, being in prison, unfortunately. So the book, you know, guides you to the whole, from the step one, from the time you're arrested, to the time you get out, if you get out. <laughs> yeah, the uh, just the other day I had uh, Ori Spado on, and uh, I asked him what was uh, what was that like. He spent some time in prison, not 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 as long as John uh, A. Light did, but he spent some time. And I said, "Doesn't sound like a good place to go." He said, "Don't go." Said, What's it like? Don't go. You don't want to know. <laughs> no, you don't. I sp I spent one night in one night in a prison cell uh, when I got arrested uh, for assault many many years ago. And um, just sitting in there and, you know, your surroundings and everything, believe me, after, after that day, after that night sitting there, uh, it, it kind of like woke me up. A bell went in my head and said, do I really want to go down this road? And I said, nah. And I just changed my life around. I was a pretty bad boy. Let's put it that way. <laughs> hey, we all had a little streak of something in us. I mean, uh -huh. you, even I sat in a cell for for a few minutes, let's say, okay? <laughs> 40, 45 minutes to be exact. And I thought to myself in that hour, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to be here. Minute, any minute longer is no good. No, 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 not at all. Um, no, I like having some freedom, definitely. So, uh, your uncle went away for uh, eight years, I, I hear. Yes, that's correct. My uncle, one of my cousins went away for two years. Um, I mean, I don't much like talking about them very much. Uh, but, uh, my uncle was a tough guy. He was in the construction business. You know, that kind of says everything right there. Uh, actually I, um, I met John Gotti through my uncle one time and it was a pretty interesting meet. Let's put it that way. <laughs> How old were you? Oh, my, I, was, I must've been in my late twenties. It was late twenties. I, it was the, uh, during the Mike Tyson fight. When Mike Tyson bit, I think it was Holyfield when he yeah. bit his ear. Right. Yeah. That, it was during that fight, watching the get watching the fight on the TV. Okay. You know, on a big screen in Manhattan. How old were you when your uncle went to prison, and how did that affect your life? Well, that affected my whole entire family. You know, because uh, like I said, 
Um, I don't like to talk too much about him out of respect. I mean, the guy did his eight years. He paid his, you know, due to society. Um, it, how did it affect me? It bothered me in a way only because not that I was really tight with him. I did work with him for a bit. Uh, what bugged me about it is that, uh, which anybody in a, in a family was, the family stopped talking to his side of the family. It was, it broke the families apart, uh, which kind of shame, you know, I didn't see my cousins for years, you know, and it's a shame, you know, you don't grow up with them and then you don't see them anymore. Uh, it was just really strange. Let's put it that way. It was just something I did not, it was not, when you're not used to it, you don't know what to, what to do when it happens. You know, you just kind of like, that's just the way it is. I was told, don't go talk to them. Don't go by there. Don't, over, don't even mention his name. And I said, okay. You know, it was what it was. So it, it was difficult. Let's put it that way. So prison rules is a more or less a deterrent for yes, uh, kids to stay out of that lifestyle. And, and the reason I asked the question about, you know, what was it like for you when your uncle was away? Because when somebody ends up going to prison, I mean, it affects more than just the guy going to prison who has to sit there and do time. It affects mm -hmm. the wives, the kids, the nieces, the nephews, you know, the whole family can get torn, can get split. And, you know, for that length of time. So that's why I asked. How many people do you no, know that fine. went? I, I, can even, I can even elaborate even more with you on that. Uh, two of my friends uh, are doing life right now. Uh, one guy I wrote about, I wrote about both of them actually. And uh, prison rules, I wrote, I wrote about both of them in prison rules. And one of them I wrote again in my Greek book, the one I mentioned, Mafia Ties. Um, they're both doing life terms for crimes they didn't commit. I know you're going to say they're criminals, you know, whatever. Everybody's innocent when they go in. But these guys, for sure, definitely are innocent because I did a lot of research to find out. And when you mentioned about family and everything, when I went, I went to visit both of them in prison. And just going to visit them or any family member, it's very stressful. You know, you understand what they do to you when you get there. You know, I went to see one of them who's in PA in Pennsylvania. His name is Nicky DiPietro. He's a, he was a wise guy in the PA Philadelphia crew on the scuffle. And um, I went to visit him once, and for some reason they had my name wrong on the chart. And when I got there, they wouldn't let me in. I drove four hours for nothing. It was terrible. And Nikki was waiting in the waiting area, waiting. Because, you know, these guys, they don't get visitors every day. So when they have a visitor come, it's like a big thing. So they turned me away. I couldn't even go inside and see him. Uh, of course, the second time I didn't have a problem when I went to see him the second time around. Uh, but again, it's a four-hour drive. You know, they do it purposely to make it difficult for families. Um, the other guy, uh, Spiro, who was the head of the Greek crew in Astoria here in New York, I went to visit him with his daughter, with his two daughters. And the second time, I went to visit him once by myself. And he was also in PA. And when I went to visit him with his daughters, I'm watching their interaction. It was crazy. It was weird. You know, these, they don't see their father. They know they're not going to see him ever again because he's doing life. He's not coming out. So you see their reaction. They're crying. They're hugging him, this, that. I felt kind of bad, you know, like this is what it's like. And people don't really realize the capacity, the emotional and stressful capacity when one of your own family members in prison and, and the way they treat everybody there. The prison, I mean the, the warden, not the warden, I'm sorry, the uh, staff at any prison, they don't give two shits about you. They don't, they, they try to make it as difficult as possible, not just for the prisoner, but also for the family as well. That's their goal. Their goal is to make your life miserable. And that's in the book too. We talk about that. Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's, that's something people don't think about, you know, whenever you're talking crime and you're talking doing different you know what's it like on the families because yeah it's no it's no 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 joke i know when i was working with frank Collada, he told me several things about being in prison that i went i had no damn way in hell that i would ever want to <laughs> <laughs> sit anywhere in those I would have, in a place i could have created a story that johnny a told me go ahead I'll, I'll let you finish no no go right ahead 
Yeah, no, I, well, I'm just saying he told me so many different things that I, I just thought. And then, of course, f from his, his family as well, because, you know, his mother was an advocate of she did not want to see her kids be, be, be bad and end up going away to prison like their uncle, like, you know, uh, uh. so, yeah, I think she, she even told, well, I don't want to get into any of that, but go ahead, tell me your story. <laughs> well, there's a story that Johnny A told me when he was in prison in Brazil. When he went on the lam, when he knew indictments were coming down. Uh, this is when he was in good with the guardies. And when he went down to Brazil, he went to one of the worst prisons in Brazil, in the, in the world. Forget about just Brazil, the world. Aya Franco is the name of it. We mentioned it in the book, as a matter of fact. And there's one time they grabbed him and they put him in a, cell, in a room that was completely black. You couldn't see no windows, no lights, nothing. You couldn't, couldn't even see your hand in front of you. And they threw him in the room. And John's a big guy. You probably saw John. He's a muscular big guy. Four officers, I think four police officers, went inside, not police officers, but correction officers, rather, went inside the room and beat him silly. Like, you have no clue. They just kept beating him with all types of different paraphernalia. So the second time around that they were going to do this to him, he knew this was coming the second time around. So the second time around when he knew, not to be disgusting or anything, but this is prison. So he knew this was going to happen. So he thought, the only way I'm going to protect, I got to do something to protect myself. So he took a shift. If you know what a shift is, it's like a little blade that they make in prison. And he inserted it somewhere. Let's put it that way. So when he, these, when he was thrown in the, in, the, in the room, he stabbed each one of these guys. So they wouldn't beat him. So just it's survival. It's crazy when you think about it. Here you are, thrown in a room, you're naked, and they beat you, and you pull this thing out of you know where, and he starts stabbing these guys because they look. I'm not going to get my ass beat again. But he knew this was going to happen ahead of time. But just think about that for a second. It's pretty crazy. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. I can't, Me neither. I can't imagine. Uh, and where did you say he was when this happened? It's called Aya Franco. It's a prison in Brazil. Brazil, yeah. yeah. So they show like a, a Locked Up Abroad. I'm sure you've seen it. Where I've heard it. I haven't seen it, but I heard of it. Oh, okay. So so Locked Up Abroad, they go into different, you know, jails in Peru and in uh, Iraq and in this place. And then Venezuela, Venezuela. I mean, this country, the prisons, they're like, they're like palaces compared oh, yeah. to being in another huh? country's prison. Like you don't want to, you don't want to be in prison in Mexico. You know, you don't want to be in prison. <laughs> oh, no, thanks. I'll it's take different, care of it. <laughs> different rules. But the, the one thing I do want to say that over here, I, I agree with you. You're right about that. But the one thing that here that's very similar to these other countries is solitary confinement, which is one of the worst things you can ever imagine. Uh, my friend Nikki that I knew that I told you about, he was, they put him in, in, they call it the hole. That's what they call it in prison. Uh, when he was in solitary confinement, he was there for a year. Imagine being in a room for 24 hours a day. You don't go out for a year. It's just, the reason why they put him in there because he beat up five correction officers at once. <laughs> so he was a pretty tough guy, but still, you put somebody in confinement for a year, I don't know. That's kind of, to me, it's a little bit of a human rights issue to me, in my opinion. But it happens here in the United States all the time. I, I can't imagine having to sit. Look, this quarantine's been going on since, uh, it's been like eight months, okay? And that just means stay at home and people are going nuts having to sit at home. I can't imagine sit in this room with no door, no light, or no, and, but no no bars, a door, no light, a slot. They throw food under the door a few times a day. No books to read. No, I I, I can't even imagine. Frank said when he was sitting, he was thrown in solitary in the hole for a, for mm -hmm. several months. He said he counted every crack on the wall, every spring in the bed. He sat there counting things. He had nothing to do but count. And, and, and just, he said it was, uh, you know, he said Grimaldi, 
who was one of the uh, uh, guys who worked for Sam Di Stefano, mm -hmm. was in was in this prison with him, and he was painting and singing in this area where Frank was. And he said, "Oh, just to hear a voice was, you know, amazing." It, it, I can't <laughs> imagine how how nutty it would make you to say I couldn't sit in a, a room like that. So, no, no way, no way, no way. I'm not built. I don't think any human's built for that. No, I, I, when you mentioned about lockdown, when I, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky enough that my office is open, but uh, when I was on lockdown for like four months that we were, I thought of it, I, the way I looked at it was house arrest. <laughs> That's why I was looking at it. <laughs> this is what house arrest would be like. Sure. <laughs> and even that's a, it sucks, you know, it's, no. It kind of sucks. You know, one of my friends was, one of my friends was on uh, house arrest for a while. You know, they had like a, he had to wear an ankle bracelet so they would know if he ever leaves the house. The feds right. would be there in a minute. Sure. So he had to wear that all the time. You know, and that was a bit of a, a pain in the ass for him. You know, but still, he was in the house. He wasn't in the cell. And he was, you know, it wasn't, he said, I would take the house arrest over anything any day. <laughs> so when you were growing up, you, uh, you grew up right outside of Brooklyn. And you you hung out with a lot of the guys who ended up in their neighborhood ended up you know going uh and and becoming associated with mm -hmm. organized crime so what was it that deterred you from going that path and hanging out with those those guys and doing the things they were doing that took them down that path well <clears throat> to give the give the people a little bit of a background which you mentioned um I was in a gang when I was in junior high school because I was, I joined them because I was being bullied in elementary school. And uh, that's how I got into that, you know, I guess scene, gang scene, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then my father had a cafe and a lot of the wise guys used to come through there. We even had our own bookie in the restaurant, no less. Um, and I saw all this and it interested me and I was curious. So, Eventually, I started hanging out with a lot of these guys and seeing a lot of things. And I went to gambling dens and things like that. Um, but when you the the thing about what deterred me is when I sat in that cell for that one evening. When I was there that night, I said, "This ain't for me. This is not. I can be. I can be a better person than this." You know, even though I did a lot of stupid things growing up. You know, fighting. Uh, I was stabbed. I was hit with a pipe in the head, I was, whatever, all these kind of crazy things. Fighting was very common, you know, back in those days. Um, but, you know, sitting in that cell, and my father, my father was a big influence in putting me on the right path, you know. So I, I owe it to him, and uh, the desk sergeant that came to my cell that night, he said to me, he goes, Nick, by the way, you made bail. I said, I made bail. Who paid my bill? He says, your father. He's outside. He's here to pick you up. I look at him like, did you see my father? And he goes, that sergeant goes, yeah, what about him? I said, would you go home with him? I said, no, I'm good here. He was laughing. He's like, I, I, I didn't want to leave the cell because I knew my father would kick my ass because he was like, you know, he's six foot one guy, big guy. I said, I'm dead. Um, but the funny thing is, the whole ride home, he didn't say two words to me. I got the silent treatment. And I'm sure you know what that's like. That's worse than somebody yelling at you. So I didn't know what was going to happen when I got home. <laughs> but that kind of like, it woke me up a bit. That's what made me change. But I'm still friends with, I still stayed friends with a lot of those guys. That's how I, I met, hooked up with Johnny A. And um, I know a lot of other guys that are in the life still. Um, I mean, some of them are out of it. I mean, that are not in the life that were. Uh, so I, I still keep my, I guess, connections, I guess you can say. There's something here, you know, you never know if you need anything. <laughs> it's true. That's true. It's always good to have, it's always good to have a couple of phone numbers to call. No, well, you got that right. <laughs> Your books. Mm -hmm. You said you wrote Destinies 12 years ago? Yep, that's right. So, and it took you 12 years to decide to publish it or, or i know it sounds nuts <laughs> to, how did it, how did that work well i was actually 
to backtrack a little bit, I was uh, the editor of a magazine called Mob Candy Magazine for seven years, uh, which ran to about 2006 to like 2012 or whatever it was. Um, during that time, I made a lot of connections within that genre. And um, after, after that, I decided, you know, let me, let me get this, let me go. I went back to the book, I revisited it. And I decided to put it out. I redid it, fixed it. And that's when I decided to put it out. When my, I guess my credit, the credibility started rising a little bit within that world, within that industry, I thought it was a good time. And it kind of was. Okay. Uh, and you say now it's going to be made into a screenplay? Or you've well, made it into a screenplay? The screenplay where the second draft is finished. Um, I sent it to somebody who's like a money guy, who knows people in, who knows the people who like to fund uh, projects. So it's just, it's right now it's in the waiting stage. Very good. Very good. That's an exciting time. So, oh, you're not kidding. <laughs> yeah, it's exciting time. That's it's awesome to hear. Uh, and you, uh, you also were in a movie, correct? Had a, a, a bit in a part in a movie called Brooklyn Ties. Oh uh, yeah, the first episode, the first episode. Sorry, the first part of Brooklyn Ties. Uh, yeah, I acted in it a little bit, you know, and uh, not much, you know. I just went along with it. Um, it was good. The director Sean King is a good friend, and he asked me to play in it. I said fine. Uh, now, the, now, the part two of Brooklyn Ties, he hired me to write the web series, which I'm doing now. And we're filming actually tomorrow. And I'm actually, and I'm also acting in it, um, and which is exciting. And uh, the, first, the first part of Brooklyn Ties is actually coming out on Amazon Prime in November. Um, and the director has already been approached by Netflix and some other companies. But he didn't, for some, he just decided not to do anything with it, with them just yet. I, I think he wants to see what the reaction with the first Brooklyn Ties is with the audience, you know, on Amazon Prime and everything before he goes any, you know, any higher. And he wants to finish part two anyway. So I, I understand what he's trying to do. Okay. Well, awesome. Congratulations on that and good luck with your filming tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> it should be fun. Yeah, it should be. It's going to be hurry up and wait. You know how it goes. Hurry up and wait. Hurry up and wait. Yep. <laughs> All right. So thank you very much, uh, Nick, for coming uh, on Coffee with Colada today. And oh, exciting. Uh, would you be willing to uh, to come back on again if any of the prescribers on the channel had questions for you? Yeah, I'd love to. Sure. Fantastic. I forgot to mention one more thing. Sure. I was, I was also on the uh, um, mob documentary, Mafia Killers last year on the uh, cable channel reels i was on four different episodes uh when i talked about Gotti, gravano gas pipe Caso, and i think it was um and gigante richard gigante huh. so they can catch me on there if they can go to youtube they can look up mafia killers uh with colin mclaren and they'll see me on four episodes i was like awesome. a mob expert i guess you could awesome. say yeah. whatever needed to be done he was muscle he was like a natural, you know, he would jump into a fight without even blinking, you know. Plus, he was a little bit psychotic. <laughs> and what, what's your website also? Oh, uh, www.nickchristophers.org. Okay, and that's going to be in the description below. You guys can click on it. Go check out his website. Check out his books. Uh, and uh, once again, Nick, thank you very much for coming on today. Good luck with all of your projects, and uh, maybe we can have you on again. I appreciate it. Thank you, Adam. All right, you got it. Have, have a great day, and you again, too, good luck tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks for watching this video, everyone. Please be sure to visit frankcolata.com for coffee cups and t-shirts. Also, hit the like button, share this video. Oh, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. The subscribe, I found gold. I hope you enjoyed yourself. God bless.